Okay, so some of you will be aware of the new thing that I've launched called the Climate Majority Project. The basic idea is to marry truthfulness about how bad our situation is, the fact that this, this civilization is not going to continue, uh, and it's a question of is there a possibility of replacing it with something better uh, before it uh, collapses. Uh, marrying that with a mass appeal. Taking that kind of truthful, realistic message, which has been at the core of the success of Extinction Rebellion and Greta Thunberg, taking that to the broad, moderate, silent, concerned climate majority, deepening their concern and activating, the, activating them. And our idea in the Climate Majority Project is to achieve this activation by way of the truth, by way of processing the truth, by way of providing off-ramps into forms of activity which are open to pretty much anybody. Could you turn your mobiles down, folks? That would be really polite uh, or off. Um, forms of activation that are open to pretty much anybody, so community climate action, everybody lives somewhere. Workplace action, most people work somewhere, turning your workplace green. If you run a business, turning that green. If you're in a profession, turning that green, using the lobbying power of these forms of enterprise as a secret weapon, really, that could potentially be absolutely game-changing. Imagine if businesses, rather than lobbying for regulatory exemptions in a race to the bottom, were to lobby for a higher level playing field for all and to drive out the bad actors. That's the kind of unexpected thing that could happen and that if it did happen might just be enough to prevent the oncoming societal collapse. That's the kind of thing that we try to co-create by working with insurers, working with lawyers, working with teachers uh, and academics, people acting in their churches, people acting in the political sphere. This is the broad vision of the Climate Majority Project and basically we are here for everybody who agrees with what Just Stop Oil, for example, are aiming at, but doesn't wish to take part in their version of tactics. If you haven't heard of us already, hopefully you'll be hearing more. I'm very happy to take questions, obviously, on the Climate Majority Project. Also, I'll be talking in detail about the Climate Majority Project, a little advert coming here tomorrow at the Voices of uh, Gaia Dome, just, uh, just over there. That's a great question. Anyone tell me, remind me of the time? <laughs> I think it might be one o'clock. It's in the Voices of Gaia uh, part of the program. One o'clock. Thank you very much. So one o'clock tomorrow at Voices of Gaia for a more detailed presentation on the Climate Majority Project. What I want to do today is to take you into one particular absolutely crucial foundational aspect of the Climate Majority Project, which is the work that we are doing with cultural creatives with people who are in the arts and entertainment to seek to deepen our sense of imagination of the civilization that could follow this civilization. And this is something which is much bigger in a way than the Climate Majority Project, but it is also one aspect of our work. So for example, we are working with a group of actors called, it's a very, very clever name, Play Your Part, about stepping up and playing your part in the response that we all need to play our part in to the climate and ecological emergency. We're working with these actors to try to start to produce content which is going to be about imagining an alternative to where we are now. Yeah, it really would be great if people could turn their mobiles off or down. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, and uh, we'll be producing with them um, one or two uh, films in the, in the next few uh, months. Uh, including one which will have a sort of slightly uh, Game of Thrones uh, vibe uh, to it. Those of you who know Game of Thrones will know that it is basically uh, a climate allegory uh, and the base fundamental idea of it is what if uh, everybody comes together despite their differences uh, and agrees to, to uh, turn against the, the, the common foe which uh, if we don't will overwhelm us uh, and also what if we don't. Uh, that's the basic uh, question that's asked in Game of Thrones. So we are in the business in the Climate Majority Project, through, partly through Play Your Part, of working on this cultural project of imagining different futures. And we consider this to be absolutely vital. Uh, and I'll seek to explain now uh, why that is so and uh, take you deeper into the title for this talk. 
So we live at a time, obviously, of absolutely hor horrendous uh, possibility. The default trajectory that we're now on is toward civilizational collapse. Um, just to reiterate, there is no power here, so I, I can't compete with other people's voices. So if there, is, if there is noise in the room, it will be impossible for others to hear. Um, so we're heading straight towards a, uh, a dystopia. And it's really important to be able to imagine that dystopic uh, future, to be able to see it clearly. It's really important that we have dystopias. But it is absolutely critical that we don't have only dystopias. And in my view, there has been a very, very serious problem with the arts and entertainment over the past generation, which is that in relation to climate, etc., basically what we have had is dystopias. That's all we've had. And not very many of them, but we have had a bunch of them. Um, things like The Road, for example. Uh, the Road, absolutely magnificent book and film, uh, crucial to engage with if you haven't. You know, extremely, extremely grim. It's not enough just to have dystopias because we don't want to be heading there, right? We want to change course. So we need to be able to imagine where we're changing course towards. So the traditional way of playing that would be, well, let's imagine a utopia. Let's imagine where we want to go to and have that as our North Star. Uh, and, uh, and then we've got a direction and, uh, and know where we're headed. Could you please turn off that mobile phone or turn it down? I have said that three times now, folks. Come on, we can do this together. We can do it collaboratively. If we can't do something as simple and small as this, we're going to have trouble with the bigger uh, issues. Um, so the problem with utopias is they're no longer available. The future is not going to be all bright and rosy and everything fine. I mean, maybe it was never going to be, but it certainly isn't now. Anyone who tells you everything is going to be fine, we're going to fix it all, is either a fool or a liar. Right? There is no super tech fix which is going to sort everything. We're not going to turn around our trajectory on, the, on a dime and uh, have a completely emissions-free society by 2025, which, let's remember, that was Extinction Rebellion's demand, right? right? We fix the biodiversity and climate problem by 2025. Guess what? It's 2023, right? We have to be honest about these, these things. The future is not going to be perfect. It just isn't. Maybe it never was going to be, but we know now that it isn't going to be. So utopias are not available. So dystopia is where, we head it, where we're headed. We need to imagine that very clearly. Yeah? But we can't just get sucked into that and fixated on it, because if we do, that is where we'll end up. Right? We have to imagine something different, but utopias are not available. So what is available? So what I argue is available is what I call throughtopia. What is throughtopia? So throughtopia is how we get through what is coming, the extremely difficult times that are coming to us, in as good a way as possible. How we get through it in as good a way as possible. There is a magnificent uh, model for this uh, in the artistic uh, literature. Uh, which is uh, Ursula Le Guin's uh, book, The Dispossessed. Uh, if you haven't read it, I really strongly, strongly recommend it. She calls it an ambiguous utopia. I think a better description for it is uh, a throughtopia, because really what she offers in that book, in her amazing kind of contrasting account of a dystopic um, society with many resemblances to ours, uh, and uh, a, an anarchist alternative to that dystopia, which is trying to realize a utopia, but in many important respects, not really succeeding. What she, what she imagines, what she shows in that novel is how the best, the closest we can get to what people used to imagine when they imagined a utopia is something where you're continually transforming in response to the circumstances that you're in and not getting stuck or settled in any kind of complacency, continually remaking uh, what you have in the face of incoming uh, conditions uh, and, and, and not relying on any one fixed set of institutions uh, to see you through. That's a very brief description, obviously, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of a, little bit of a flavor. Is that another mobile that just rang? So, so this, this is now the fourth time. Oh, is it from outside? All right, sorry, sorry, false alarm. Okay. Um, yeah, so... Um, and that, and that that she describes is very similar to the situation we face. We're going to be faced with continual incoming from now on. People sometimes ask, 
people sometimes ask me, what is the new normal going to be? And I say, sorry, you haven't really got it. You know, there isn't going to be any new stable state. We're going to be dealing with a, with a need to constantly transform in the, in the face of the destabilized climate and destabilized, destabilized world ecology, which is going to be our inheritance and our children's inheritance for a long time to come. So this is what I call transformative adaptation. And if you want to find out more about transformative adaptation, we've got the transformative adaptation village at the bottom of the hill, the Trad Village. And I'll be giving a little talk about transformative adaptation on, uh, Saturday, uh, on uh, Sunday uh, down there. Uh, so, um, Throughtopia is getting through what is coming responsively, transformatively, in the best way that, that we can. And here's the good news. It could be really good. And I think we all know this, right? I mean, we, we see a lot of it in embryo at places like the Green Gathering. Right? We see a lot of the elements of the possible future society that we can start to create and scale up and so on in a place like this one with the permaculture and the trad village and the, uh, the arts and crafts and the solar power and so on, which usually works and, and all this kind of stuff, right? Um, so that's the basic idea of Throughtopia. And so here is my fundamental claim. We need dystopias. We unfortunately can't really make much use anymore of utopias. But above all, we need, and what has been missing, Throughtopias. We need Throughtopian visions. We need people to actually be able to imagine and to see in their mind's eye and to imaginatively inhabit what it will be to get through what is coming in the best way possible. Now, what do we have so far by way of Throughtopias in relation to the climate and ecological uh, space? Well, not a great deal. There's a certain amount in, in literature. So some of solar punk kind of broadly qualifies as, uh, as meeting my sort of uh, Throughtopian type uh, criteria. Some, for example, of Kim Stanley Robinson's uh, work has elements of, it in a, elements of it in a book like Ministry for the Future, which is a book I would highly recommend, although I would, I would say two things about it. Firstly, it's unbelievably uh, grim, so much so that when I started to try reading it, I had to just put it down for a few months before I could come back to it. And secondly, it's over-optimistic, uh, <laughs> I'm afraid. I mean, the way that he sketches uh, how we are going to get through what's coming contains, in my view, quite a lot of wish fulfillment fantasy about politics and, and uh, how people can work together and so forth. So, you know, it is going to be tough, but what we need to have is those full-scale artistic imaginations of what it could be like. In relation to TV, there's been a, a total absence so far through topianism. Absolutely zilch. Um, there's been now one series, uh, at least, which does actually look at climatically inflected futures. That's Apple TV's uh, show Extrapolations. Um, it's good. I recommend uh, watching it uh, if you can afford the subscription to Apple TV or get some kind of special free deal or do something naughty on the internet, ask your child to do it for you or something if you don't know how to. <laughs> Uh, um, but there, there is at least two problems with, uh, with extrapolations. Firstly, it is basically a dystopia, a dystopian vision of the future. And secondly, even worse, it's a dystopia with a sort of tech fix uh, bolted on uh, at the end to sort it all out so that you're pulled out of your misery at the dystopia. It is not, in my sense, a throughtopia. It doesn't, does not coherently imagine an alternative future or set of futures to the one that we are headed into. So we've, we've got remarkably little so far of this genre of throughtopianism. That is, however, starting to change. As I say, there's stuff coming through in the field of, uh, of literature, uh, and there is stuff starting to come through in relation to film, mostly not feature films yet, but, but shorts and things like that. Um, and Amanda Scott, who unfortunately is uh, not with us here today, but as I say, you can hear us talking about this, if you wish, on her Accidental Gods uh, podcast. Amanda Scott is pioneering the attempt to broaden the genre of Throughtopianism and get a lot more of it happening. Uh, she now runs a course called, uh, I think it's called Throughtopia, um, where she bring, brings together budding uh, writers and artists and, and creatives and tries to encourage them to imagine and work together on visions, actually tangible, possible visions of decent futures where we get through what is coming in the best way possible. 
that are explored in those various different uh, artistic uh, media. And what Manda and I both believe passionately is that if we don't succeed in starting to imagine better, believable futures, i.e. through topias, not utopian wish fulfillment fantasies, through topias, if we don't succeed in doing this, then we will definitely fail. We will definitely end up in dystopia. Because at the moment, and when I say this to people, there's usually an overwhelming degree of agreement, but I'll be interested to know how this room uh, responds. At the moment, most people find it actually very hard to imagine a future which is different from what we've got uh, and believable uh, and OK. Right? Most people, it seems, either imagine that we're basically somehow going to muddle through with something similar to what we've got, which is absolutely not going to happen, or they imagine something completely unrealistic, like a tech fix or a, an instant worldwide eco-socialist revolution, uh, which is absolutely not going to happen, or they imagine dystopia. And they find it actually very hard to imagine a set of coherent paths through what we have to a different and better civilization without, uh, at best, going through a kind of complete uh, collapse first, which you know, is what may well happen. But I think it's easy to agree that if we can avoid a complete uncontrolled civilizational collapse and transform and transition in some way which avoids that, then that would be uh, a preferable outcome. And that's what the idea of Throotopia uh, uh, seeks to uh, imagine. So this ties back in, um, and I'm moving towards the end of my remarks and then looking forward to discussing with you. This ties back in with the ambition of the Climate Majority Project in the following way. Because the elements of our theory of change, which I sketched earlier, are, are as follows. We, we say you have to start with climate reality. You have to start with, with not avoiding the truth about how bad our situation is. It's not enough to just to throw that truth at people. You have to provide ways of processing it to people. And that can be in all sorts of ways. It can be through things like um, the Deep Adaptation Forum. It can be through the Climate Psychology Alliance. It can be through counselling. Uh, it can be through peer groups. Um, one thing which we are arguing for in the Climate Majority Project is that it should be mandatory that attached to climate and eco-education is some kind of processing psychological type element. Because if you actually teach children and students and so on the truth, as I've been doing for several years now in my university, um, it's really tough on them. Uh, and they need to have resources uh, of support. So that's the second element of our theory of change, processing, handling the truth, building shared uh, resilience, shared inner work. The third element is activation on the basis of the first two. Activation at scale, at large, asking the moderate, concerned, silent climate majority to step up in their communities, in their workplaces, in their places of workshop, etc. And the fourth, this is the one I'm coming to, the fourth is shared sense making, shared understanding, shared ability to imagine that this is actually something which is starting to happen. It's already happening. You know, we in the Climate Majority Project, we're not saying we're making all this happen. No, we're spotting that it's already happening. Some of it happening, it's kind of, as it were, spontaneously. Some of it happening as a result of the sort of um, dissemination of, uh, of Extinction Rebellion into the world, people moving on from Extinction Rebellion, many of them founding these new moderate flank-style um, organizations uh, in relation to uh, the law, in relation to insurance, uh, in relation to rewilding, in relation to community uh, action, and so forth. So joining this all up, starting to realize that it is inevitable that we'll, there will be more climate activism in the 2020s, that it is inevitable that there will be a lot more climate action, much of which will not be in the form of activism. The work we do, for example, with uh, senior corporate lawyers. Right? So these are lawyers inside corporations, top lawyers. They're, they're not activists. Right? You ask them if you're, they're a climate activist, they'll laugh. But what they're trying to do is to turn their companies in the right direction. And it's starting to happen uh, in one or two uh, companies. That it's inevitable that there will be this phenomenon starting to emerge. The question is, will it be quick enough? Will it be wide enough? Will it be deep enough? Will it be wise enough? Will it be joined up enough? Will it be aware of itself enough? The climate majority, which is there, needs to become aware of itself and needs to manifest, it, man manifest itself uh, in the world. And that requires it to understand that it exists and to, and to see itself and to start to imagine and feel its incredible transformative power. And that's what really excites me about this whole thing. 
And like, you can see now how that ties in with the project of imagining a better future, right? You see how that joins up, right? When we start to imagine coherently a better future, a way of getting through what is coming, which won't be a dystopia, a throughtopia, then inevitably a lot of what we have to imagine is the shared success, the realization of something like this climate majority. Right? It's not just going to happen through tech. It's not just going to happen through uh, the radical flag. It's not just going to happen through divine intervention. Right? The majority of people are going to have to make it happen because there is no way we get to succeed on this without the majority of people behind it. Right? This is not like the ozone hole, for example, in the 1980s, which was essentially something you could fix by elite action from corporates and, uh, and governments. This is going to require kind of everybody, but certainly a majority. We have to be able to imagine that. We have to be able to see it. We have to be able to feel it as a possibility. And my friends, it is. Thank you. <laughs>